Here we continue our lecture on descriptive statistics. Welcome to the lecture. This is just to remind you of what you already saw in the first part of the descriptive statistics lecture. Um, we are looking at uh, measures of location. We did that already. Now we start uh, and we continue. We look at measures of dispersion. Uh, measures of shape and uh, looking at different ways to combine measures together. Uh, some of that is actually going to be done in standardizing data, which will be in another lecture, and working with data from two variables, which is not here, will be in another lecture. This is all a single variable. Uh, so we still have a lot to do. Why do we need to look at measures of dispersion? Maybe mean is enough. Well, this example will show you why you want measures of dispersion. You're a company and you want to buy computer chips and they're gonna have an average life of at least 10 years. You have a choice of two suppliers. We'll call one supplier A, supplier B. If he's smart, you take a random sample of chips. In, in this case, they took a sample of 10. All right, and look at the data. The data's right there. And you can see the mean for the supplier B's chips is 94.6 years versus 10.8 years for suppliers A chips. Which one would you use? You only looked at the mean. You say, wow, B has an average life of 94.6 years. So that's the one you choose. But if you look very carefully at the data, you'll see A is very consistent. The chips, the 10 in your sample, every one of them lasted 10 or more years. But look at B's chips. Some last at 170 years. You don't need that. Or 160 years, or 150 years. But several of them, you know, didn't even get to year three. In fact, four of them, four out of 10, didn't make it to year three. So we need a way to measure this kind of uh, dispersion or variability, if you like. And certainly, if you're smart, you don't take chips made by supplier B. And the measures that we're going to use we're going to look at a whole bunch of measures of dispersion, but now at least you understand why you want measures of dispersion. If you didn't look at measures of dispersion, you would make the mistake of buying chips from supplier B, because the higher mean, even a higher median too, in fact, those are measures of location. But we're going to look at other measures that will warn us not to buy chips from supplier B with this so much variability. What do we mean by dispersion? It's like the spread of the data. You have a bunch of numbers. If they're all very, very close to each other or very close to the mean of the data set, it obviously has a very small spread. What about if they're very far apart? They're all scattered. They're not near each other. And they're far from the mean of the data set. That has a high dispersion. So we're going to look at five measures of dispersion. The range, the interquartile range, the last three are really almost the same thing. Standard deviation, variance, and coefficient of variation. We often do them together. Those are the five measures of dispersion we're going to examine. First measure of dispersion we're going to look at is the range. It's, it's the obvious one. It's that we're all bo born understanding it. You don't need to take this course. Uh, you certainly don't need to be a statistician. You can even explain this to your boss. Um, the range is just the range of the data, the largest value minus the smallest value. You see a bunch of data over there? The range is the largest value minus the smallest value. 30 minus 1 is 29. Isn't that easy? This, you don't have to know the center of the data. You don't have to know how many data items you have. Just the largest and the smallest. Easy to explain. You can explain the range to anybody. Anyone can understand it. That's a huge advantage. What's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is if you have any extreme value at the, at the low end or at the high end, it's going to blow up the range. And the range won't really be a very, very good measure of dispersion. Imagine if all the values are close to each other or close to the mean, and then all of a sudden there's one out at the high end. Uh, that won't be a very, very good summary measure of your data set as a whole. The interquartile range is just what it sounds like. If you remember your quartiles, it's the range between Q3 and Q1. So instead of taking 
largest value minus smallest value, we take the value of the third quartile minus the first quartile. What happened over here? Look at the data. Uh, sample size is 15. Uh, the um, interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1 or 22 minus 3. Um, and that's 19 as opposed to the range, which would have been 98. Look at that huge value at the end. Nin 98 is the largest value. Zero is the smallest value. The range is easy to understand, but in this case, it doesn't really give you very much information. Uh, the interquartile range now is a, 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 a smaller number. Uh, it's a number that's um, uh, easier to understand. But the way to understand the interquartile range is that it is the range of the central 50% of the data. Okay, If you take the central 50% of the data and separate it out, and you can do that easily with quartiles, the range of that is the interquartile range. Any extreme values on the high side or on the low side are, are basically uh, um, uh, thrown out, right? Then throw it out in this case. We're not looking at them. They don't affect this measure of dispersion. Of course, that's also its greatest flaw. Um, data is very expensive. It's expensive to purchase. It's expensive to collect. And what we're doing here in order to compute this measure is throwing away 50% of the observations and only looking at the central 50%, the range of the central 50%. So let's see if we could do better. Okay, let's look at the standard deviation, one of the most famous measures of dispersion. What is a standard deviation? First of all, deviation. Deviation from what? Well, it's deviations around the mean. It's a kind of an average. You're kind of aver averaging out the deviations. It's a little problem, though, if you just look at the deviations around the mean. The deviations around the mean mathematically would be the sum of xi minus x bar. Guess what? If you do that, you'll get zero all the time. So the average deviations about the mean are just zero. All right. The reason for that is you'll have plus deviations. You have some of your values above the mean, some are below the mean. They kind of always work out mathematically to give you zero. So that's why we can't just take an average deviation. Here we see the formula for the standard deviation. It's called a definitional formula. Okay. So we take the average deviations, but we don't want the pluses and minus to balance each other out. So we square the deviations. So we take the sum of the xi minus x bar, that's the mean of the data set, we sum it, and uh, we're summing squares, it's called the sum of squares, we divide by n, s, n minus 1, now you'll ask why don't we take an average, divide by n, there's a reason, mathematically, we'll get to it. Alright, so there's your formula, that's called a definitional formula, and it has lots of interesting mathematical properties. The one I mentioned, by squaring you don't get, you know, you don't sum up to zero. All right, this is also a minimum, this sum. No other value subtracted from the data set, from the x's, no other value that you, you can look for deviation of the square will give you a smaller value than this. It's called the least squares property. And finally, which I mentioned already, we divide by n minus 1, not n. It's called a loss of a degree of freedom. You'll see it's a mathematical adjustment. We're looking at two data sets. We'll call them X and Y. Notice they both sum up to 15. So the average is 15 over 5. So both have the same average of 3. Yet we'll see, look at the variability. X, the first one, the X is relatively close to the 3. But the second data set, you got zeros and tens. Obviously, there's a lot more variability. And we'll see what that does. Look at the uh, X's. All right. So we have first column is the data, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The mean was 3. We're looking at the third column, which is deviations, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus. Notice it adds up to 0. Okay, now we have to square them. So we square those each of those deviations. Again, it's called a sum of squares. Okay, so we take each of the uh, deviations, square it, sum it, and we get 10. Okay, now you take 10. Remember, it's n minus 1. You divide it by 4. Take the square root of that, which is basically the square root of two and a half, and you get 1.58. So the standard deviation for x is 1.58. Now look at the y. You see the deviations are much worse, much higher. We got 0, 0, 0, 5, 10 in the first column. The mean is still three. 
So three, three, three. But look at the deviations now. Minus three, minus three, minus three, two, and there's even one of seven. Square all that, and now you got the sum of squared deviations or the sum of squares. Notice it's 80. I think 80 divided by n minus one, four, and that's the square root of 20, which is 4.47. Notice the standard deviation for the y's, the y data set is 4.47. The standard deviation for the x is 1.58. This is what we saw intuitively. The variability of the y data set is much more than the x data set. Okay, now we're going to explain why we divide by n minus 1 generally. The reality is if you took a census, you'd have no problem. Then you'd be trying to measure the population standard deviation. And notice the formula is also the sum of the squared deviations, but now you're using mu. It's a population. You have a census. And now you divide by capital N. Okay? There's no bias here. You don't have to worry about any kind of bias. And uh, so the formula, and again, you, be, you have to be careful when using a program like Excel. This standard deviation, you have to divide by N. And I think Excel calls it standard deviations uh, underscore P to show you that it's a parameter or a population. But normally in this course, we're going to always assume you've taken a sample. That's generally the way it works in, in the real world. You're taking samples. Now, when you're taking samples, S is supposed to be estimating sigma, the population standard deviation. Now, mathematicians have shown us that when you do it, you must divide by n minus 1. Otherwise, you're going to introduce a bias. S will not be an unbiased estimator of sigma. If you want an unbiased estimator, then you have to divide by n minus 1. Again, those of you who have more advanced mathematical training, you can look this up in a math book. You'll find out why. But that's why we divide by n minus 1. So all you have to remember is that when you're getting the standard deviation, if you're working with a census, which is rare, then you'd be dividing by n. If you're working with a sample, you take the deviations. Notice you're using x bar, not mu. That causes the bias, actually. So you're taking the sum of the squared deviations around the x bar. You divide by n minus 1. And now s is an unbiased estimator of sigma. So you'll hear the term losing a degree of freedom. Essentially, if your boss says, why are we dividing by n minus 1? Should we be averaging it? You tell your boss you're right. But mathematicians show us this introduces a bias. So to um, get rid of that bias, we must divide by n minus 1. And you'll see this in Excel, too, that there's a, a standard deviation when you're working with a parameter or population, and there's a standard deviation when you're working with a sample or a statistic. Our uh, next measure of dispersion, the variance, is really just exactly the same as the standard deviation. It's a, a formula that, that takes the standard deviation and, and squares it. Or conversely, when you got the standard deviation, um, you ended up the, the process with a square root. Well, everything that was under that square root is called the variance. Uh, it's easier to explain standard deviation because you're using the expectation that uh, we want something that's kind of averaging our deviations, and it's a form of averaging it. So it's harder to explain the variance. In addition, uh, the standard deviation is in the same units as the original data. The variance is in those units squared. It's harder to explain that. But it's still a valid measure of dispersion, and it's used all the time. Um, we're going to use uh, the definitional formula, same as before, same as with the standard deviation. Um, the definitional formula, why do we like it? Well, it, it helps you to understand what you're doing. You can see the deviations there. You can see the sum of the deviations squared. Um, so you know you're looking at deviations, and it, it helps you to understand that you're looking at the spread of the data about the mean. Um, the computational formula is the, co the one that you need to use if you're doing uh, a computation with a lot of data. If you're using a calculator, you'll use your memory. Most likely, you'll be using something like Excel or some kind of statistical package. Or if for some people who write those statistical packages, they're going to be using the computational formula. The computational formula, as it sounds, as, as you can tell from the name, uh, it's easier for computation. In addition, there's less rounding. What happens with the definitional formula, as you'll see when you do your own problems, x bar is a mean 
um, you already have rounding there. Every time you subtract it from um, a data value and then square it, you're compounding the problem of a rounding. So there's a lot of rounding in the end. Uh, we don't care because right now all we want is for you to understand it. In the real world, when you do this for real as a, a user of statistics or as a statistician or as a business person or as anyone who has to deal with numbers, you're going to be using the computational formula and you're not even going to have to know the formula. It'll just be what's being used in Excel or some other software package. But what I want you to do and what the other Professor Friedman wants you to do is to understand um, the formula that you're using in order to measure dispersion. Finally, uh, the, the final measure of dispersion we're looking at is the coefficient of variation. Uh, the coefficient of variation is a little bit different from the others, is it doesn't only measure dispersion in the data, but it creates a, a, a raw number, a perfect number, a uh, percentage. And that means that you can compare data sets because you're not comparing uh, apples and oranges in the, you know, the, the classic uh, uh, metaphor. Um, look at that formula. Uh, you can see that what you're doing is, ask, is answering the question, what percent of the mean is the standard deviation? So you're looking at the standard deviation in relation to the mean. You can do that because they're both in the same units. And when you cancel the units, you get a pure number. You multiply by 100% and you get a percentage. So for example, if you find a coefficient of variation that's 100%, it means the sample mean is equal to the sample standard deviation. Wow, that's a, a lot of variability. And what if you find the coefficient of variation is 200%? Certainly, um, that's even worse. So if what we want to do is to look at more than one set of data, we probably want to include coefficient of variation in our metrics, in our summary statistics, in our descriptive statistics. Uh, why? Because um, we cancel the effect of the units if we're using coefficient of variation. So that if, for example, we have a couple of examples here. Uh, if, for example, you're looking at two stocks and you want to compare them and see which is more variable, which is more volatile, and one is in dollars and one is in yen or in some other currency, uh, how do you know? You know, how do you know just from looking at the numbers? Well, um, the mean is in the units, let's say dollars. The standard deviation is in the same units. If we divide one by the other, we're getting around the effect of the units and looking at just a pure percentage. The same thing is true, by the way, even if both uh, data sets are in the same units, but are in um, order of magnitude very, very different. Uh, in this case, the example is saying, you know, what if you have a stock that sells for around 300 as opposed to one that sells for about 25 cents? Um, go even further. How about if you're looking at income data and you, uh, one, one data set uh, is in the millions and the other data set is around minimum wage. Uh, you can't really compare the volatility. There's no way to know until you actually get the metric where you're canceling the effect of the units. So the coefficient of variation is not only a, a, a better measure of dispersion in these cases, it's a very necessary measure to have uh, at our disposal. Those of you interested in finance, with, we have an example here with two stocks. Look at stock A and stock B. Now, if somebody asked you, a customer, a client says, which one is more risky or volatile? We use volatility as a term in stock, the stock market. Okay, if you just to look at the uh, standard deviation of variance, look at the standard deviation for stock B, it's 11.33 dollars look at the standard deviation for stock a it's a dollar 62 you might make the mistake of saying well stock b has a much higher standard de deviation it's more volatile but you'd be wrong look at stock b the numbers are really very close to each other you just your, your mean is very high your average is 188.8 so when you look at deviations you can get big numbers relatively speaking because $200, $210 minus 188, okay, so you're looking at um, $22. 
Now look at stock A. There, the, the average price of the stock is a dollar seventy. So your biggest deviation is five dollars minus a dollar seventy, just three dollars and thirty cents. So you might again, looking simply at the standard deviation or even the variances, you'd make the mistake of thinking stock B is more volatile. Notice what happens when you look at the coefficient of variation, which is not in dollars. Okay, the variance would be in dollars squared, actually. The standard deviation is in dollars. Coefficient variation is a percentage. So the coefficient of variation for stock A turns out to be 95.3%. Okay, showing you that's a lot of volatility. Okay, that's incredibly volatile stock. And you can see looking at the numbers, this stock at one time was 20 cents in August, and then it jumped up to $5 in July. And then you see it's you know it's been jumping around all over the place. You can lose a lot of money investing in a stock like that. Stock B, look at the coefficient of variation. It's six percent because it doesn't vary that much. Okay, it was 210 in August and it was 175 in February, but that's not you know as huge a jump as you see with stock A. All right. So the conclusion here is that do not use the standard deviation to compare two stocks use the coefficient of variation that's uh has no units it's a percentage and it essentially gives you the idea of the standard deviation what percentage is it of the mean okay let's look at a, a problem we're going to get all all the basic descriptive statistics okay the data has been ordered for you, starting with zero. There's 10 observations, 0, 0, 40, 50, all the way to 100. Okay, now you're asking the descriptive statistics. Well, the mean, you add them all up, the sum of the x, which is 560, divided by 10. So the mean is 56. The median, remember what you got to do when n, is, when n is even, you look at the two middle values, and then the middle value of the median, q2, is 55. Okay, the mode, well, which one came up the most frequently? Well, it seems like you have three modes, 0, 50, and 100. Okay, the approximate Q1 and the approximate Q3. Remember, the numbers below the median. You have five numbers, so Q1 is 40. You're taking the median of 0, 0, 40, 50, 50. Do the same for the ones above the median, 60, 70, 90, 100, 100. And so the median of that, or those five numbers is 90. So Q1 is 40, Q3 is 90. The range, okay, now it measures a dispersion. The range, highest minus lowest, 100 minus 0, okay, the range is 100. The interquartile range, Q3 minus Q, Q1, and you got 90 minus 40, which is 50. Okay, this, the variance, well, this is when you're going to have to take each number minus the mean and square it. So you're going to do 0 minus 56 squared. 0 minus 56 squared, 40 minus 56 squared, until you get to 100 minus 56 squared. Okay, those are the sum of squared deviations, the sum of squares. That's 11,840. Remember, you divide by n minus 1. 10 minus 1 is 9. And there's your variance, 1,315.5. The standard deviation, just the square root of that, which is 36.27. And the coefficient of variation, is a percentage, 36.27, which is the standard deviation, divided by the mean of 56 times 100%, and you have a very variable data set. It's the coefficient of variation of 64.8%. That's quite variable. We have looked at um, measures of location in our data, in other words, where this data sits on the scale of real numbers, and especially uh, the central uh, central location, measures of central location, the center of gravity of the data. Then we looked at measures of dispersion. How far apart are the data from each other? Uh, how far apart or how dispersed is the data around the mean? What, how large is that cloud of data? What does it look like? And now we're looking at the shape of the data. Is the data symmetric about the mean or about the median? Or is it uh, skewed by extreme values, either on the right or the left? If our data is um, skewed, it could be positive skewed or negative skewed. If it's positive skewed, it means that uh, there are extreme values on the high side. 
And so um, the mean is greater than the median. If it's negative skewed, it's the other way around. It means that there are extreme values on the low side. And so the mean is less than the median. And of course, this is nothing new to us because we already know that the mean is affected by extreme values, while the median is always going to be the center point, the 50% mark of the data. Uh, here is the same explanation, only uh, with pictures, a graphical explanation. Uh, you can see that if something is left skewed, it's pulled to the left by an extreme value or more than one. If a distribution is right skewed, it's pulled to the right. Kind of imagine you know, an, elect an elastic band uh, uh, um, being pulled by some large data value. If it's symmetric, you don't see either one of those, uh, then the, the data set is symmetric around uh, the center, uh, the central location, the measure of central location. Let's examine a data set. We're looking at 12 employees and determining how long it took each of the 12 to complete a certain task. Note the, the fastest employee did it in two hours, where somebody did three hours, eight hours, and then the maximum value was 63 hours. Somebody took a long, long time. In any case, you look at the mean of this data set, and the mean is 180 over 12, which is 15 hours. The median is 10 hours. When you see a huge discrepancy between the mean and the median, that tells you something. It usually indicates what we call skewness. Now notice the mean is much higher than the median. Again, the mean is 15 versus a median of 10, a five hour difference. Now, what caused that? Why are the mean and the median so far apart? And obviously you look at the data, you'll see there's one value, you might call it an outlier, that 63 seems to be very different from the rest. That 63 throws everything, th throws everything off. Now, what happens when you have one very high value? It makes the mean higher, but the median, which is really location, stays where it is. So the median is 10, but that 63 now throws the mean, so it's much higher than the median. And the same, by the way, would happen on the left side if we had a very, very low value. Okay, but this is called a positive skew. And you see the mean is so much more than the median, you have what's called a positive skew. I try to imagine in your mind if that 63 would be 163. Let's say it's the boss's uh, son and he's a total klutz. It took him 163 hours to do something that should take about 10 hours or so. Well, then now the mean is even higher than 15. It jumps. Okay? So you can't fire the boss's son, but you certainly can have very skewed data. And this is called a positive skew because you have a very high number, an outlier, that throws the mean and makes it much higher than the median. And just to complete the data set, all right, let's look at the variance. Turns out to be 2868 over 11, which is 260.73 hours squared. Again, don't ask what a square hour is. That's what happens when you use variances. You get a square, so a square hour. The standard deviation, uh, which is the square root, is 16.15 hours. And the coefficient of variation is 107.7%. And just uh, as a statistician, you should look at this data and say, that's interesting that the standard deviation is higher than the mean. That shows the incredible variability in a data set. If you're in quality control, you want that a coefficient of variation to be a lot lower than 107.7%. But that's again, something for another course. But anyway, now you've seen how data gets skewed. One way of uh, presenting data is with a five number summary. That gives you some information about the shape. Basically, you need the smallest value, which in this case was two, the largest value, which is 63, the Q1 and the Q3, and Q1 is eight, and Q3 is the average of 15 and 18, right? One thing we could see from this data set, just looking at it, well, we have the median too, by the way, of, of 10. Just looking at this data set, we could see the distance between Q3 and the largest value is a lot more than Q1 to the smallest value. That's going to indicate that it's, it's skewed to the right. So we're going to see that this is skewed data. Again, look at the bottom. You can see 
the distance from Q3 to the largest value is 16.5 to 63. And that's a lot more than the distance from the smallest value 2 to the, law, to the Q1, which is 8. So that's an indication of a, a right skew. This is another way to present the data. It's called a box plot or a box and whisker plot. Uh, sometimes they use the word whisker. You show the data from the smallest to the highest. You see the line starts at roughly 2 and goes all the way to 63. Okay. And just looking at this, you could see in the box in the center, which gives you Q1, the 8. And then you see, um, you see the median there, which is 10. And then you see um, Q3, 16.5. Now notice this, the box, which has Q1, the median, and Q3, is all the way to the left. It's not in the middle. When data is symmetric, it'll be right in the middle. Everything will be, uh, you'll see that, what it looks like. Common sense tells you what it's supposed to look like. Here we see that whisker to the right, which starts at 16.5, it goes all the way to 63. That's a long, long whisker. The whisker on the left, which starts at 2 and goes to 8, this is a tiny whisker. It's the same logic we had before, by the way, with the five number summary. But you can get this kind of printout. You, you ask for a box plot or a box and whisker plot, and some computer programs will print it out for you. And right away, you'll see if the data is skewed skew to the right, skew to the left, or if it's symmetric. If everything's in the center and it's centered, then you've got symmetric data. This is not symmetric. We're still in the middle of the uh, descriptive statistics part of the course. Um, there's going to be another descriptive statistics lecture uh, following this one. Uh, but for now, you have enough material to start doing problems and remember, do your homework, do whatever problems you can find, um, find problems everywhere, because the more you practice, the better you're going to be. You'll remember the material, and you'll also do well on your exams. Uh, practice, practice, and as always, practice.